as you know, of course, uh, we have a Swedish feminist foreign policy right now. Uh, and we've had it for a year and a half or almost two years. And we hope that it will continue on that track. Uh, do you think for a small country like Sweden, is that the most effective way of actually achieving a feminist forest policy, of declaring it? And what do you kind of consequences and effects do you think it can have? Well, I think declaring it, I mean, Wallström, declaring it and calling it that has really had quite an enormous impact outside of Sweden. Now, let's be realistic here. How many people actually follow Swedish foreign policy, right? <laughs> so, let's, yeah, yeah, well, yes, well, besides them, right, those people on Mars or something that don't. But, so, so we're not talking about a tsunami of new comprehension, right? But we are talking about a very recognizable ripple that is putting, again, put what words you put together that people don't usually put together, and s feminist foreign policy. I mean, one of the things that's happened to me in the last, oh gosh, really, last couple of months, I guess, is that pe I'll say the phrase, and people will say, what's that? And that's the best, isn't it? Right? They don't just say, Bleh, you know, well, they might in their heads, but you know, they're more polite, most of the people. And, um, and they actually say, well, what is it? And it gives me a chance to repeat back. I mean, I didn't dream it up, you all did. But it gives me a chance to say, well, this is what feminism looks like, which is always a valuable thing to do. I mean, I, I think one of the great things about being constantly amongst 18-year-olds, you know, university younger students, is that you see skepticism as really positive, right? The kid in the back row with the baseball cap turned on backwards, you know, just waiting for you to say something stupid, <laughs> right? Um, or irrelevant, which is the same thing in their heads. Um, and and I, I, I like that. I mean, in the sense, because I think, well, that's our job. Our job is not just to speak to people who see feminist foreign policy as something that makes total sense, right? But rather to say to people, well, you're right to be skeptical. Let's talk about what Sweden is trying to do, or at least some Swedes in some positions in some parts of civil society and of government. A feminist foreign policy has to be daily done. It is not something that is declared by the foreign minister and then it is achieved, right? It is something that every time a particular decision has to be made or every time you think a decision should be made and other people don't want to make the decision, right? There's, there's the non-decision decision. decision. Um, that is making a feminist foreign policy. And probably, again, you're the ones who can tutor me in this, but probably what's been really interesting, and you're so engaged with it, is, okay, so what does it look like? What kind of decisions are you having to make in civil society, within government organizations, or as partners with certain or government organizations? What kind of decisions do you find now you have to make? Right? I mean, it's not just arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Right? Um, which is the only thing, by the way, that made news. The only thing, right? At all. Um, so, but you all know that it is a tapestry. Well, it's a tapestry if it doesn't come unraveled. It is, it is a constant weaving of a tapestry to create a feminist foreign policy. And that's every day. And that's at all levels. The question I also asked, what consequences and effects can it have? And you said, well, honestly, how many people care about Swedish foreign policy? And the only thing that made it to the news was the Saudi Arabia yeah. case. So then how, how are we supposed to think about it? How can we make it more effective? 
Well, I don't think being effective is simply getting in, being picked up by Reuters, you know. Um, I mean, because the media, and you all work with the media constantly, I mean, I know, um, the media, one of the real problems about the militarization of the media is the shrinkage of the notion of what is worth a story, what's news, right? And what's news, maybe it's always been very, I mean, I shouldn't, let's not glorify some golden age of the media as if, oh, they used to be so interested in, you know, women's experiences of, you know. Um, but, but it is true today that the narrowness of what the media, and it's particularly the 24-7 drive, right, which is really like a prison, right, for journalists and editors, that the notion of what is a story, what is newsworthy, is so shrunken that it makes anything that isn't dramatic and drama now is militarized, right? So you have to have conflict in order to be dramatic. Um, the youngest feminist has just joined us. <laughs> I just mean, um, but that the if it's not dramatic, it's not news, and it's not dramatic if it's not conflict, and it's not really conflict unless at least there's some hint of violence lurking, all right? And that makes the kind of work you do, by definition, not newsworthy. But that doesn't mean it doesn't have an effect, all right? So I think to have an effect really means, I mean, you do have to think, and I know all of you think about it a lot, but you do have to think, how can, if you want media coverage, you do have to think of how to create a story that is interesting to journalists who have their own pressures to create only certain kinds of stories. But I don't think it's the only way to have an effect, right? So I think we shouldn't just be driven by what will capture CNN at two in the morning. I mean, feminism is, is, is in my opinion, is growing globally. Mm, it is. Uh, but there, I think maybe you could say that there are different kinds of groups that take on the word feminism, which is, I think is really positive. Yeah. What kind of different strands do you see of feminism? You know, we have, in, you know, in, on the, in Africa, the continent, there's a lot of strong feminist mm -hmm. movement. And then North America or, uh, and Europe has a very old uh, feminist mm -hmm. movement, the movie The Suffragettes yeah. premiered here. In yes, Sweden, yes, I saw and, it. Yeah, uh, I saw it in New York. You yeah. saw it in New York. Okay, well, um, uh, yeah, and I heard a lot of people talk, uh, talk about yeah. it. And uh, so I think, you know, we have over then 100 years of defining mm -hmm. feminism and it's growing with, with connection to mm -hmm. religion. What are your thoughts on this? You know, what different strands of feminism do you see and will there be clashes? Well, there certainly us? will be discussions arguments, uncertainty, but that's, that's okay, you know. Um, uh, and because any of us, I mean, we become feminists, and if we're working collectively, we co collectively organize as feminists, where we are, right? And where we are is very distinctive in any place, right? And if you're a Kenyan becoming a feminist and creating a feminist movement, um, or, for instance, the newest, two newest chapters of WILF are Cameroon and Ghana, right? And talking to those women in The Hague when they came to the big WILF 100th anniversary meeting was fascinating. And the, when I was standing, you know, it's the hallway moment, right? And the Ghana women said, I said, well, what are you I mean, what is it that, that now is most engaging you? And they said, talking to school children. That's our feminism. We want to talk to school children in, they meant elementary school children. And we're going around the country, the few of us that have formed the WILP chapter, to talk to school children about militarism, to talk to school children about what peace can look like in their lives. And I thought, absolutely, 
you know. But it wasn't necessarily exactly what the Pakistani women who were getting their coffee, you know, down the hall. That's not exactly what their first thought was. And I'm working now with a, a group at the Business University of Pakistan called LUMS, which is a very elite um, business school in Pakistan. And they're just starting a gender program within the equivalent of the Harvard Business School. I may now talk about challenge, everybody, right? <laughs> and, but these faculty members, um, they're interested in feminist budgeting. They're interested in feminist, creating feminist cultures within large company organizations. They're interested in getting lums, very elite, very ambitious students to actually think about Pakistani women who are doing domestic work. And so it doesn't mean that automatically the Ghanaian women who are really concentrating on peace education in elementary schools are at odds with the Pakistani women who are trying to bring feminism into elite business education in Lahore are at odds with each other, but doesn't mean that they'll immediately engage in the same conversation, right? One might think the other is really trivial. One might think the other is beside the point. One might think that the other isn't where you start change, which is, of course, one of the biggest debates we all have with each other, right? You don't have 28 hours of the day. You barely have 24. Um, you don't have endless resources or endless uh, energy or endless people to work with. So where do you start? And that's one of the biggest debates to keep having, right? But it shouldn't be paralyzing. Countering Malik Jimson has been on the United Nations agenda for quite a long time. And I know that that group of people, because we actually met with a few of them in New York, they've been trying to attach to the Women, Peace, and Security uh, agenda boy. for quite a long time. But now it seems like something has happened. And now also then the Security Council has... It's when uh, somebody co-ops. And in the Global co -ops. Study as well. It was a, a chapter yeah. in the Global Study in yes. 25. Right. I mean, part of this is the political problem of translation. I mean, I mean really political translation. I don't just mean language translation. And what, so I'm going to back up a little bit. One of the things that is such a challenge for you, I think, is to make sure that the Iraqi human rights defenders do not have to speak a language, and I don't mean English or French or Arabic, they don't have to speak a language that somehow doesn't accurately describe what it is they are trying to do and what it is they are threatened by. Because I think it's one of the real problems of the kind of globalization, well, no, the bureaucratization, because it is bureaucracy, the bureaucratization of certain concepts which then everyone else has to somehow, it's like a too tight fitting shoe, has to squeeze their complicated reality on the ground into in order to be credible at a level that thinks that this concept is meaningful. And so part, so this doesn't get right to CVE itself or doesn't get to the reality that supposedly CVE describes. All right. Um, come back to that for a minute. But I think one of the things that is so challenging, I think, in the, your work in Jordan next week, you said? Mm, two weeks. Two weeks. Um, is to constantly reaffirm for the Iraqi human rights defenders that they don't have to talk a language that, in fact, distorts the reality that they are trying to make sure that the people in Brussels understand. Countering violent extremism, of course, is a kind of war on terror.
talk, isn't it? I mean, and this is what makes me really nervous about it. It's not as if we all don't, I mean, we've collectively, and all of your people that you work with who aren't here in the room, we've all probably thought more about violence than any of the people in Brussels, right? I mean, one of the enormous contributions that all kinds of feminists have made to this world is to think about violence as a process, to think about violence as highly personal and highly structural simultaneously. That's what feminists, I mean, we have many contributions, I think, collectively that we've made, but one of our biggest contributions in the world is naming violence and looking at its gendering, looking at the relationship between acts of violence, motivations for violence, justifications for violence, consequences of violence, memories of violence, um, countering violence, adopting strategies of coping in the midst of violence that are gendered, right? I mean, who but feminists? have really thought about that so with such nuance and with such historical uh, curiosity and with such personal empathy. But when it is packaged so that it can become a state and interstate policy and often ideological stance, what happens to all that nuance? What happens to all our sense of process? What happens to all our sense of the gendering of violence, right? And so I'm not answering your question well at all, except to put up, yes, so somebody else can help here, because my sense is, is first of all, to put up the warning flags, right? Not so that we are paralyzed and not so that you think, oh my God, I can't be of any help to these Iraqi women. Not that at all, but rather to really find ways, and this is your skills, right? I mean, I'm sure you are oftentimes the intermediaries between people, as we so often say, on the ground, but you're on the ground, you know, that phrase, but between people who are doing the most immediate, hardest work in the midst of all kinds of violence and the people who should be obligated to protect them or assist them or validate them. And that there you are, right in the middle. So you are translators all the time. And the hardest thing to do is not to just think that the main thing you've got to do, and I'm sure you have consciousness you don't do this, but the pressure's on you is to constantly make the people doing the messy, hard feminist work, or at least women's advocacy work locally, make them fit the Stockholm, Washington, Brussels, Paris, Geneva shoe. I actually just also want to um, uh, raise the flag of worry for this concept, but actually from a whole other perspective, and I yeah. want to have your, your thoughts on that. Um, I don't come from the, the feminist movement originally. I come from the peace building yes. very strongly. And my sense, uh, which I had already with, of course, the terrorists, war on terror, as you talked about concept, I'm feeling a little bit the same with this, and it's about the labeling of yes. extremism. Um, I'm just thinking if we want to come in as a peace builder, how useful is it to call a group an extremist group? Not saying they're not, because certainly we are dealing with extremist groups in many of the countries where we are, but I'm just thinking labeling that. I agree. Labeling them something that they wouldn't label themselves. Does that help in our peace building work if we genuinely want to build peace um, so that's my fear that uh, uh, yeah. we might uh, actually make ourselves less of a, a viable peace building actor by adapting a concept that 
labels them. So I just wanted to get your. So this is. Yeah. No. This is a, this is exactly the conversation. But I wanted to get your reflections on that, or yeah. or do you think no, we should we should really find a way to relate to this? Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting, Molly, as you're talking. Don't you sometimes look and and all of a sudden realize you there are certain terms that a lot of people use and you just don't use it. <coughs> and I don't. I don't think I use the word extremism. Um, and then I'm kind of interested. Well, no, I just don't. Um, and I think it's partly because there are a lot of people, <coughs> misogynist people, who aren't part of any movement but are extreme in their insecurity and their wielding of violence out of their own insecurity. So I guess I do talk. Well, I, I just, I think you're right. I just don't think it's very useful. And I also, I do just really think I have my antennae out for anything that is trying to co opt 1325, the feminist spirit and intelligence behind 1325 and try to co-opt it into the war on terror. I just, I think my, my antennae are just really out and, and, and I, I hear that labeling as if extremism isn't something we all deal with in many varieties, oftentimes which come without, you know, um, a rifle in hand and come with suits and ties um, that makes me very nervous about those kinds of easy labels that, because what it does is if you can label particular groups as extremists, it makes everybody else look moderate. <laughs> And, yeah, and that really is dangerous because then you can't call out the militarists who sound so reasonable and join you for a cappuccino. We have years, as in decades, of experiences related to us by women who've been in all kinds of militaries. We are not starting with the Peshmerga. We have had stories from women in the Vietnamese military that was the <coughs> Hanoi organized military, not the Viet Cong in the south, but the northern. We have their stories. We have stories of women who are in the, um, the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, of the Chinese Revolution. We've had, we have stories of women who were in insurgencies, state militaries. This is not new. This, I mean, the bibliography that would include lots of memoirs, it is really long. So this is, for a lot of us, this is not kind of a brand new topic. It may be a new topic for a lot of people who haven't had the chance, I mean, they just weren't prompted, didn't have the incentive to look at this. But we have a lot of experience of thinking about this. And so when I try to think about it, I actually try to bring to bear what other people have taught us. And here are a couple of things that we've learned from women in the Sandinista military, from women in the Vietnamese, Hanoi-driven, but if you will, liberating army um, of Vietnam, um, women in the Angolan military, women in the Guinea-Bissau military, women in the uh, Zimbabwean, two arms of the competing arms of the Zimbabwean anti-Rhodesia military. I mean, we have tons. And here's what we've learned. And it's almost uniform, almost uniform, which is Women are useful at a particular point for mobilizing ends. 
and they will be recruited for those ends by male leadership. Two, simultaneously, for a lot of women who are usually young women, so we're talking about the experience of 17, sometimes 16, 17, 18, 19, maybe 20 year old women when they join. It is empowering. It allows you to delay marriage. This is big. Um, it gets you away from your family. That's big. It makes you feel as though it's just like young men in this sense. It makes you feel as though you're part of something big, capital B, all right? As an 18-year-old, maybe a 20-year-old. And in that sense, it's exciting, it is empowering, it is new, it builds your self-esteem, you feel important in ways you've never felt before, and for girls, and this is different than for boys, for girls, you are breaking some parental expectation, some, if you're part of some religion, tra religious tradition, you're breaking some religious um, tradition's expectation. You're maybe even breaking your own expectations of what you can be and what you can do, which is really quite different than for an 18-year-old man who is fulfilling his expectations. It's really different. 18 year olds joining a military for a girl and for a boy, because they are young, are really different experiences. Those things are true at the same time. There's an instrumentalist, usually male strategized reason for, not always, but for sometimes or at some point in some violent conflict to recruit young women. For those young women, they don't feel used, they feel empowered. The third thing, and this is why one, all of us, have been taught by these women to follow it over time. Watch the Eritrean young girls. Watch the Zimbabwean young girls. Right. Um, because with both of them, we've got decades now to to follow what's happened. When the end of the conflict comes, girls, girls are the first to be demobilized by the male leadership of any force who only wanted them for a purpose. And now the purpose is ended and they should go back to their true calling, which is to become mothers of the nation or to become unpaid household workers and good wives. Diane Mazarana, um, M-A-Z-U-R-A-N-A, -A, Diane Mazarana, <coughs> um, and that's D-Y-A-N, um, she is the first to ever ask, where are the girls? And what she meant was, where are the girls in fighting forces and those fighting forces as they become demobilized? And to watch the girl, and she watches them in Mozambique, northern Uganda, I think Sierra Leone. And she said, leader after leader demobilizes the girls with their new infants because there is oftentimes sexual relationships within insurgencies. Not all, it depends on the insurgency's gender policy towards sexual relations. With their, often with their infants, they are literally dropped off the truck. And then the boys and the older men go on to the DDR camp. That if you follow afterwards, what kind of political in the broadest sense that you all use it. What political benefit came to all women by those women having been in either the state force or the insurgent force during that conflict? That's the question to ask. And it is not clear 
except on national holidays in the most ritualized form, that all women have gained a lot. There is a certain leverage. Marie Amy Heli Lucas, who some of you know, the Algerian uh, combatant in the war against the French, one of the reasons she left Algeria and started Women Living Under Muslim Law. Do some of you work with Women Living or do you follow them? Yeah, they're one of the smartest organizations around, I think. And Marie Heli, uh, Amy Heli Lucas, she left Algeria because within a couple of years after the Algerian, quote, revolution, the now male government, for the sake of nation building, which now would be called peace building, but nation building, passed a, the most patriarchal family law. And with her leverage, she and other women, as former combatants in the successful revolutionary conflict, they spoke out, they lobbied in front of the parliament, that is now the Revolutionary Party's majority, and they weren't paid attention to. They tried to wield that leverage of, but we helped create this new independent Algeria. And the notion of a patriarchal national social fabric was so embedded in the male leadership's notion of building the new Algeria that she left. And that's what women living under Muslim law, they came out of that experience. Let me just start with the, the Donald Trump phenomenon. One of the, this is all about the Republican Party primaries. All right? The, it's, it's for the process by which voters in many states get the chance, if they identify officially as Republicans, to vote for who they want as their candidate to their party. And the primaries were introduced as versus the party leadership making the decision about the candidates. The, the primaries were introduced in the United States not until, it wasn't the way John Kennedy was chosen, for instance, it, uh, in the late 60s. And it was supposed to be a radical well, if not so radical, an important reform, because it was supposed to take the choice of party presidential candidates out of the hands of the guys in the back room. And it was usually the image in American language was out of the smoke-filled rooms. And the smoke-filled rooms were presumed to be masculinized smoke-filled rooms with an occasional effort by some woman politician to have an effect, but they were supposed to be. And so the primaries were supposed to give the general public who identified with a particular party. So you can only vote, if you vote in the Republican primary in Iowa or in Massachusetts, our primaries come up on March 1st, um, you can't vote in the Democratic. In some states, it's all state by state, states make electoral laws. This is the good news and it is the scary news. That's why the state legislature in Ohio, for instance, which is a Midwestern, Northern industrial state, the state legislature in Ohio, which is now Republican dominated, has imposed these very narrow identification laws is really driving down the black vote. It makes it really harder to vote because you have to show certain documents at the polls to be able to vote. That's a, it's what a lot of us call a voter suppression strategy. Most of those voter suppression that we call voter suppression strategies have not been overturned by the courts. I mean, they're challenged in the courts a lot of effort now by progressive organizations to get out the African-American vote, to enable Latinos to vote, to enable poor rural people to vote, is in fact an effort to try and 
circumvent those voter suppression laws that are becoming more and more prevalent in many states that have Republican dominated state legislatures. So it's just to say states matter in all this. Donald Trump scares the hell out of the Republican establishment. He is not a mainstream Republican. He has no allegiance or interest in the Republican, if there, well, there is no Republican establishment, and he has no interest in it. He barely is interested in the quote unquote Tea Party radical rebels inside the Republican Party. So his role in American politics today is not, oh, here is the, ha <laughs> ha, the CVE of the Republican <laughs> Party, right? <clears throat> He's not because in, of the party, because in fact he is not a creature of the party. He is not backed by the party establishment. There are meetings of party establishment people. That means Republican governors, Republican senators, Republican big donors. They are meeting to decide that if by some chance Donald Trump gets enough of these primary delegate wins, because it's all trying, these primaries are to elect the state delegates to go to the Republican Party convention and whoever gets the magic number will be the nominee. If by some chance he manages, which will be hardest in the South probably, if he manages to get the nomination because of delegates, the discussion amongst Republican Party establishment people evidently is, should we run an independent ticket? Should we run somebody against, this is Republicans talking, should we run somebody against Trump? Because he's a disaster for the party. In a terrible, maybe, way, I'm not interested in Donald Trump. What I'm interested in is the media have made him a viable candidate because he's so entertaining. This is, again, what media thinks is a story as, and what media think is worth covering. And if you've got a 24-7 um, pressure on you, then Donald Trump is gold, right? Mm -hmm. And so he, until recently, because of the way the Iowa primary is organized, you have to really be organized to win the Iowa primary because they're small caucuses. They really, it's a very different way to run a primary than just an open go out on Tuesday morning and cast your Republican ballot. But he didn't need much, not just because of his own wealth, but which he trumps a lot, if you pardon the pun, um, but because he um, has CNN at all giving him free airtime. Mm -hmm. Nobody else has free airtime. Cruz has to buy free his airtime. Rubio has to buy his airtime. The primaries have made big, the primaries that were supposed to be a democratic reform have made money king mm -hmm. because you have to buy so much television time. Not to mention you have to have your own jet plane to get from one state to the other within the same 24 hours. You have to have money to run this primary system. But CNN et al., Fox, everybody, they just think Trump is the most entertaining story you can run, and you can run him constantly. Palin doesn't matter at all. Palin is really so ignorant, right? And she doesn't, nobody talks about Palin anymore. I actually think she came out to endorse Trump so she gets some airtime. And it's the first time that she's been featured on any news show, I don't know, in three years. Um, so Palin doesn't matter. It's the Trump voters that matter. That is, what do they find appealing? And what one hears from people who talk about it is that they like him because he's not a politician. But that, this is for all of us who are communicators. That means what is it that people who 
are serious about running for elected office and get into elected office, what is it that they're not getting across? What is it that either the media doesn't allow them to speak in whole sentences or that when they have a chance to, they somehow don't seem honest or credible? Or trustworthy, well, trustworthy. Maybe we as feminists can help them there, since we've had a lot of time yes. trying to get messages across. Well, and I think the feminist the media initiative. Don't care yeah, but I think the feminist initiative candidates here have worked really hard on that. I don't mean they're the only candidates that yeah. haven't, but they've thought so much about it. And so, Trump is a appealing to people who don't trust elected officials, mm -hmm. and also to those people who, yes, I mean, it is about racism, it is about anti-immigrant sentiment, but it's also about, now this is very American, the, the trust in, not all, certain kinds of rich people, preferably rich men, yeah. right? Much more trustworthy in the popular imagination than rich women, right? Yeah, rich, uh, because allegedly they are independent. Now, the truth is that Donald Trump isn't independent from his own self-interest. No. I mean, he's a real estate developer. That's what he is. That's, he's absolutely tied to anything that promotes real estate, private real estate development. He's not independent. But there is that notion in the popular imagination in the U.S. that certain kinds of rich men are independent in ways that ordinary mortals who run for office aren't because they actually do have to buy airtime. Final thing, Petra, because I know we've run out of time, and that is, will Hillary Clinton make a difference? Here's one of the things we know, is that when she was Secretary of State, which is really important to look at, and some of you are familiar with this, she really tried to change the structure of the State Department. She tried to institutionalize in the State Department, which is not a really powerful American bureaucracy. It's not as powerful as the Treasury. It's not as powerful as the Defense Department, although she made it an equal for the first time in a generation of the Defense Department. She demilitarized American foreign policy by insisting that the State Department not be, which it was under the Bush years, feminized. That's, that's exactly what happened under the Bush years. And she said, the State Department will be an equal player and when necessary, the dominant player in American foreign policy. That was a radical change when you think of the years under Rumsfeld mm. and George W. Bush. But besides that, besides demilitarizing American foreign policy by making the State Department the predominant player and civilian diplomats the predominant players in American foreign policy making, she also institutionalized within the State Department structures to promote women's human, <laughs> women's human rights and women's reproductive rights in American foreign policy. Is that as overarching as um, a feminist foreign policy? No. But it's not nothing. 